Okay, so for this last session, we're going to talk about barley. Um, we've had wheat and we've had canola and we've had soils, but this is obviously just before your beer session, obviously a key ingredient for the next part of the conversation. We're going to talk a bit about theory in this part of it, about practice. So obviously what we're asked to talk about is how we get more yield um, out of barley. Obviously we've had a switch in the system at the moment. We've largely focused on delivering malt barley. If you're going to grow malt barley, you're actually holding the yield back to maximise grain quality to deliver into those premium specs. Whilst the market uh, conditions have changed quite a bit, obviously the focus is really around how do you get more yield. And it's really just tweaking the things that we've done. So the, the barley crop in Western Australia has grown significantly over the last 10 or so years. It's because we've pulled the major levers that are available to us. And so the research that um, that Steve Hurd's done um, in partnership with the GRDC, for example, has demonstrated what most of those main um, levers are. But, you know, the, the basic principles, uh, principles are is that we're trying to pull together agronomy, variety, and the season. In, in, in the words of season, that's where we put soil amelioration as far as I'm concerned, because you're making the bucket size bigger. We've got yield gaps that we're trying to manage. Uh, and when, when you put them all together, that's ultimately where you, you get your maximum yield. So it's really around optimising the variety of choice that you have. And obviously, we've got a good range of varieties available to us. It's overcoming the seasonal constraints, so obviously amelioration and am amendment, and that's really important there. And then using the best available agronomy for the season to reduce that yield gaps to end up with maximum yield. So what we're going to do um, first is I'm going to introduce um, Hamad Khan. So where's Hamad? Um, so come up, Hud. So Hamad's a new member of our team, so he's been working with us for, um, for 12 months now. And so Hamad's role is around barley physiology, and it's looking at where we can drive um, yield um, forward um, um, in, the, in the next part of the process. Um, and then we'll get on to some, um, some, of the, uh, some realities of what we know. But just in terms of some of the key messages that we'll get you to take home today, the optimum sowing window for maximising yield for barley is around that mid-April to mid-May um, window. It's a bit of a problem with this um, big thing up here. You can't actually see all the, all the backslides. Look, see what you're looking at, the, um, the projector screen. Look around the side of it. But obviously, that's where a, um, appropriate variety choice comes in with those early sowing dates is trying to avoid the frost risk. We do have a plant density requirement in barley. So barley is not like wheat. So uh, earlier, Dion said that uh, essentially barley, uh, wheat's not responsive to plant density because you get compensation in the head. However, barley is responsive to plant density because you're relying on tiller number to drive your yield. So in low to medium rainfall, we're talking about that 130 to 170 plants a square metre. In, in the medium to high rainfall, we're talking about 180 to 220 plants a square metre as being your targets. The other concept that we introduced at crop updates early in this year is around whether or not you can use your grain protein history from your farm as an audit for where you are um, in, in your farming business, so what farming practices, what rotations, what um, management practices are, are optimising yield, and what the data would suggest is that if your grain is below 11.5% protein, it's not likely that you're near your maximum nitrogen limited yield um, on that part of the farm. The other part about is when we're looking at this coming season, is that if you're looking at obviously the cost of nitrogen and where you're going to get the biggest bang for it, what we've seen in our trial work is that you're getting a much bigger response from your nitrogen applications if the crop's sown before the middle of May. In some situations, you might need to put on a, a plant growth regulator like Motocevo to protect yield. You don't get more yield, but you just mean the crop's standing up and the heads don't fall off as easily so you can actually get that yield that you've actually grown. In terms of the, um, the variety, so the variety guides are about at the back. I'm not going to talk about varieties of today, which is ironic for me, because normally I do talk about varieties. But everything that you need to know about the varieties that are available at the moment is in the sowing guides. And if you need to have a conversation beyond that, then please come and talk to me. We've, we've tried to provide more information and, um, and, and look at the data set slightly differently so that to give you the best information about where we think the varieties have a fit for in this particular state. We talked about the soil bucket, and that's really important. If you're going to get more yield, then obviously if you can amend and ameliorate the soil bucket, so basically for the rainfall that's there, you can grow more yield, and obviously it's really important for barley. The other thing we talk about is obviously barley, you use it where you've got weeds. However, if you can get rid of the weeds before you plant your barley, you'll actually get more yield. I mean, there's quite simple things there. There's nothing new in, this, in, in any of these concepts that we've put up. 
they're really the key messages. Um, and what we want to do now is just move on to the theory of getting more yield out of barley. And this is where Hamad's going to come in. So, thanks, Hamad. Hello. All right. So, thanks, Blakely. Um, I will be talking more about the putting in some ideas and sharing some thoughts around the yield potential and how can we tune the plant growth within the season. <coughs> uh, not a friend. Um, if we want to improve the barley yield, there are two options available, not for just for barley, but any crop. Um, either you want to improve the yield potential and the yield, if you want to improve the yield potential, you need to have diversity um, among your gemplasm for specific traits and obviously breeding for that trait uh, using uh, various tools including genomics, physiology, and phenomics. Uh, but the other way is to uh, attain the yield potential which variety already has. Your farm yield is normally lower than that because of all those constraints which I've listed. Um, for example, soil management, weed and pest control, apex stress. So all these things can uh, have an effect on how much uh, yield potential you can attain. Um, but there are a uh, few uh, areas where we are already, you know, um, uh, barley team is working, but we want to get involved in few as well, for example, in the physiology and phenomic space, and also in abiotic stress tolerance, crop management factors, and some um, other areas like using PGR. Um, so if we talk about the barley yield, um, it is a product of grain number per meter square and the grain weight. This is really off. <laughs> uh, but okay. Um, but in barley, grain weight, uh, the yield is uh, variation is not governed by the grain weight. Most of the variation is due to grain number per meter scale. And grain number per meter scale is a product of ear number and the grain per ear. So I'm going to talk about these two from here onward. Um, if we want to improve the yield, then we need to understand the different development stages of the barley and what is critical. And um, in this um, figure here, uh, this shows um, the blue line, which is showing the tiller number um, over time. And these are the spiked pyramidia, which ultimately becomes the grain. So this is about the setting the uh, grain spots um, in early reproductive state. So this is the stage where obviously vegetative and early reproductive stage where the barley sets the yield potential. So if we get a good uh, potential at this stage, obviously we'll have a high uh, grain uh, number at the end. But the second critical stage is here where the yield potential is set, but then how much you get at the end. Of the, this is about the survival of those grains and the tiller so that you can maximize the number of grains per meter scale. So if we want to improve the barley yield, we have to focus on this stage where it's setting the yield potential, but also on this stage where um, how much of the grains and the tillers are survive um, under the certain conditions. So um, I wanted to put some numbers in there so that you know it, it's a bit clear what we are talking about. This gives a perspective on how much we increase we want and how can we do that. So this is um, um, a table where um, I'm just giving an example um, that if we have 600 per meter scale years and if we have 25 grains per year, considering 40 milligram grain weight, we can get six ton per year. So this is just one example. And if we wanna increase just two grains per year and everything else is the same, we will get half a ton, you know, um, per hectare. And this is almost 8% um, increase in the yield. Now, this one is again, you know, we are considering that everything else is same. It's just we're increasing the grain number, right? And that means with every two grains per year, we can have 8% increase in yield, which is in this case, um, um, half a ton. Now, there's other approach um, which is about increasing the ear number. So the, the earlier one I've showed is about increasing the number of grains per year, but this is about increasing ear number. 
And here what we are doing is we're keeping the grain same 600 years and we're getting this six ton per hectare yield. But what here we are doing is we're increasing the year number. And ultimately we're getting the same result as here, but what we are doing is we are adding 48 tillers in there. And what this tells us that if we wanna increase, for example, 1% yield, we'll have to increase, oops, sorry. We'll have to increase 1% tiller, which can be, depending upon the plant density, can be very high. So this is obviously based on how much you have, uh, how much uh, years you have, and how that's uh, how you will calculate how much years you wanna increase. So this is a perspective. If we wanna increase, for example, 8% yield, we need to increase either two cranes or 8% tillers. Which way we wanna go? That's the, uh, again, discussion uh, where the most likely possibility is and where we can go. Um, the, this is all good that we can increase grain number, we'll increase yield, but this is not that straightforward. So what we have to think is that if we increase the grain number, how do we fill them up? So before I move uh, ahead, I would just wanna explain that this is barley plant and if we um, uh, have grains, these are called sink. And all the green area during grain filling, uh, I would say is a source. This includes leaves, stems, and also the um, uh, spike as well. So all these provide photosynthesis to fill the grain. And normally varieties have really tight sourcing balance. So if, we have, if you increase the grain number, you might have a reduction in the grain weight. So uh, compromising on your quality. So explaining that, now I'll go forward and discuss about the different yielding environments because this can have different effects. So if you have a high yield potential environment, uh, most likely your um, variety would set really high yield potential, which is again, as we discussed earlier, particular stage pre and cis. Source is not a limitation normally under high yielding environments, pre or post and cis. The limitation under those environments is sink. So if we wanna increase under those high yielding environments, we have to focus on improving the sink. However, when we talk about the low yield environments, uh, story is a bit complex because uh, how the variety has been bred, they can um, set really low yield potential because that's how the variety had been bred at that time. And that already creates sink limitation. Even if you have a really good season, you create a lot of you know source you still have limited sink to fill, right? But at the same time, uh, during the grain filling stage, there is a source limitation, especially uh, because there is stresses, heat stress, drought set, terminal drought. So all these things create a source limitation then. So essentially the, uh, the barley grown in the low yield environments could face both sink and source limitation. So if we wanna improve the yield under those conditions, we have to look at improving uh, this relationship of both source and sink because there can be uh, both limitations as well. And this is what we are trying to understand that current um, and jump problem, uh, what's there. Um, another thing is, uh, this is about the yield components, but another way of improving the yield is through physiological approaches, where you look at the physiological traits and see the variation within your germ plasm and target that to improve the yield. And if in a physiological sense, the yield formation is based on light interception, how much light plants intercept, and then converting that light into the biomass. And there's, there can be different efficiencies in different varieties that how efficiently they convert that light into the biomass. And that's called radiation use efficiency, which you can't see here, uh, but it's called radiation use efficiency. And then obviously we have Harvard index but most of the cereal crops and especially barley and wheat as well, the harvest index has reached that potential and, and there are limited opportunities to improve yield through that. So what we have to explore is either these two, but there has already some work on light interception. So there might be opportunities in the light interception as well, but I think important is that how good um, our jump plasm is and how to exploit that uh, differences in the radiation use efficiency for future improvement. Um, so I have been doing one experiment where I have been using these um, eight varieties. The idea of this uh, uh, experiment is to identify the yield constraints in spring barley in WA conditions. So what we are looking is that, uh, oops, 
explore the yield formation and the sourcing balance in different genotypes. And these genotypes we have selected based on their different characteristics. For example, if we look here for three genotypes, Planx, Maximus, and Rosalind, they, their main yield driver is through having more tiller number. And similarly, uh, Planet has uh, more grain number per year. So, and the last four has more grain. So, but at the same time, they have many other traits which are interesting. For example, the height, their leaf erectness, and, and their flowering time as well. So all these are different um, characteristics as well, but um, we have selected based on these main yield drivers. So um, I, I don't have, because the, the trial is still in, in the ground, so I don't have a lot of data here, but what we have been doing is during the grain filling stage, we have been uh, manipulating the sourcing balance to understand how different varieties are behaving if the source is limited or if the sink is limited. And what we have been doing is that we have been um, um, shading the part of the plot, we have been shading the um, spikes and removing the leaves. Um, all these three uh, uh, treatments are basically limiting the source, whereas uh, only one treatment here which is degrained, so we remove half of the spike during grain filling, early grain filling and that actually reduced the sink size. So this will tell us different varieties how they behave under these treatments and where they have the constraints or advantages. Um, one of the thing, uh, like I was saying about the yield potential. So um, we were looking at setting the yield potential. So we are also looking at those varieties, how they vary in setting their yield potential. So here we have beast on the left side and uh, uh, planet on the right side, beast has 35, whereas planet has 42 potential grain sites. So they, at that stage, that early reproductive stage, this is how they are putting different uh, yield potential already. But we have to see what happens at the end. Now at the end, we have the same beast and planet, and they have both reduced the kind of number. Although they have lost one third of their um, grain numbers, but you can still see that barley has uh, six more gain numbers than the beast. So setting high yield potential at early grade stage has benefited bar, uh, uh, planet. So this is the trait we can, you know, um, uh, important for barley to survive and have more yield. But bar, uh, planet uh, might have other deficiencies, which is another discussion, but at least setting a heel, um, high yield potential is one of the traits. We are also trying to understand the physiological basis of different traits. For example, radiation use efficiency, we are using different tools and also photosynthesis to understand if the varieties differ in that because that provide information on your source. So uh, the message from uh, these uh, uh, few slides is that uh, most of the chronic uh, um, uh, practices have contributed to the yield uh, improvement, but we need to look beyond that, and future yield improvement is likely to come from the grain number on your per meter scale. And if we wanna increase grain, uh, in future we are trying to consider improving the grain number and trying to improve the sourcing spells as well, and we will be, we're trying to be involved in that space. So I will just take a pause at this stage. So if someone has any pressing questions, please go for it. Uh, obviously we'll have, towards the end, we'll have time for questions, but if there are any questions uh, which you can't wait, <laughs> go for it and you know, um, I'll try to answer. All right. So the second, part was about attaining the yield potential, and that is, there, there can be a lot of different uh, opportunities, but I'm just gonna mention one opportunity, which is around using the plant growth regulators. Um, traditionally, plant growth regulators have been used for um, lodging and head loss reduction, um, but we need to look beyond that because plant growth regulators have diverse functions in plant growth and we, we can use them. The traditional, uh, uh, traditionally they have been used in the broad acre crop because of their cost and obviously inconsistent results as well over time um, based on the environment. Um, but as the science is evolving, uh, 
there are more products available which have more um, stable field life and they can they are being tested in the field condition as well not just in the glass house so um, they are coming and we have access to some of the growth regulators as well and there are future opportunities as well where we can you know manipulate plant growth in other ways not just plant growth regulators and especially it is important because uh, we can use plant growth regulators for at a target growth stage if we want certain results and this is an important tool if I in future we want to have um, a resilience farming system where we can use something when it's needed only and uh, we have at the moment a couple of uh, synthetic urea regulators um, which have been shown to improve the barley and wheat yield um, uh, in field conditions but in Europe so we want to test that here uh, under W conditions they, there are a couple of them and they have been used for different purposes. So one is we are thinking to use at the um, early reproductive phase to see if they have influence on setting the yield potential and also around the um, grain filling stage. So if we have a stress going on, so one of them is anti-senescence. Another important technology which uh, I would, before explaining that, I would refer back to the a talk from uh, Young that he was saying that gene editing. So gene editing can change the plant DNA and that uh, effect is fixed in the crop. So it will go from generation to generation. Uh, whereas this technology is, is not fixed. So what you do is you are actually uh, um, operated spe uh, specified alteration in traits. So when you want, for example, if if you see the weather is, uh, you know, getting really dry in the next few weeks, let's spray this so that plant can tolerate that, you know, uh, weather. So what this is doing is this is transiently uh, repro reprogramming the agronomic traits. There is no genetic modification, so this is not passing from one generation to next generation. So this will be only when you want to do it during the season. For example, you want to reduce the height um, or you want to um, certain trait uh, goes off and on so this this can happen so all, all of these are in uh, advantages there is another that this can happen at industrial scale as well this has the potential for that um, but the problem at this point this is a recent technology but the problem with that is that re regulatory issues are not defined yet so we we are a bit uh, away from that uh, at the moment um, another thing is that you need to have prior knowledge about the gene which you are turning on and off. So if you don't have basic science knowledge about a certain gene, then um, it, it, it requires that knowledge to target that specific gene. But once you know the gene, then it's easy to uh, manipulate time of flowering, vernalization, plant height, uh, about stress tolerance if you know the genes, and many possible other um, avenues as well. Um, so this has really good potential and we wanna, um, we are really optimistic that this can have a uh, future effect in the WA farming system, um, but obviously we'll have to wait some time on that. So um, concluding these a few slides that there are novel products available and novel technologies available which can be used uh, in the field and they are being tested in the field conditions as well. So. Uh, they would provide another option to fine tune the plant growth based on your uh, needs within the season. And we're trying to, uh, in being involved in that research as well uh, in uh, field application under WA conditions. That's it from me. Any questions on that? If there's any burning questions for Hamad, you got the chance now, or otherwise we'll have the Slido at the end after Blakely's talked. Um. So I'll hand over to Blakely now. Sorry about those um, uh, slide um, glitches. They were perfect on the, on the slides as we developed them, but unfortunately transferring from here to that machine and putting into a common um, background has meant that um, um, the slides have been blown up a bit. So we just talked about the theory. So obviously grain number per square metre is really the way in which we're going to increase yield in barley going forward. Obviously genetics are going to play a significant part in, um, in, in that process. We've pulled a lot of the levers. 
We'll talk about some of those levers now in terms of what we've done uh, um, and how we can maximise yield. So the, um, the first one is really around timely sowing. We'll talk about um, a natural optimal practice we can do now. We'll talk about using the grain protein stories, perhaps an audit for your business, and obviously talk about why plant density is important for barley. So this is the hypothetical um, grain yield response to, to date of seeding. So the blue is essentially what we see now. Um, we've got an optimum sowing opportunity. We can seed before that op optimum sowing opportunity and we may maintain the yield and we may lose yield. And so in the, demos in the examples that um, Dion and um, Jeremy and Brenda put up, obviously you've got a, a curve. So early sowing was lower yielding, then it got higher yielding, then went down again. So that's what happens in, um, in wheat. Um, and we get similar things happen in barley. But there's also the opportunity with that early sowing to actually get more yield, and that's the bit that we want to work on, is how do we get more yield from those earlier sowing opportunities. And so obviously with, in the wheat space, we've got the development of longer maturing um, uh, wheat types that potentially could uh, reduce some of the risk for wheat due to frost particularly, and give you that higher yield um, in that first part of the curve. So this, this is essentially what we know for barley in Western Australia. So we don't have the same um, drop off as you do in wheat. The differences in our varieties are much smaller um, with that earlier sowing um, when it comes to um, that April um, planting window. So essentially what we see in our barley data is a yield plateau from about mid-April through to about mid-May. Then after that period is when we start to see yield decline um, in the varieties. Obviously frost becomes the reason why we do lose yield in barley rather than the variety itself. It's more about getting um, um, a loss of kernels um, due to frost with that early sowing. And we see about a half, up to sort of half to 0.7% yield decline from about mid-May in our research trials. So this is just the supporting data about um, where, we, where we've got that general arrangement from. So this is some data from 2015-2017. Um, we've got nine trials, the same um, range of, of varieties were in those trials from Rosalind to Urandi, so we've got quite a range of, of maturity windows and as I said, we're not seeing a lot of variety interaction in, um, in these experiments. And where we haven't had frost, we've obviously had a yield plateau um, in the trials and then we've lost about 33 kilograms per hectare per day after that um, um, when, when it does drop off. And obviously with frost, then obviously yield improves the later you flower, even though we've got like um, Urandi style varieties in, in, in the trials. If we move to a longer, you know, in the old days when we were thinking that 27th of May was early, then obviously we've got a lot of data around that period of time. And again, this is from 2006 to 2011. Um, Munda to Gardner, so it's again, um, a significant um, range of maturities in that thing. This is 31 trials worth of data. Um, and we've got that hop. So from late May to um, mid June, around 15 kilos per hectare per day over those years. Um, and then from mid-June to early July, another 25 kilograms per hectare per day. So that's the supporting evidence why we think there's a yield plateau, roughly from that mid-April to um, mid-May in the absence of frost. And then obviously we're getting yield declines after that particular date. One of the things we've got, however, is we've got a phenology gap. So this is um, from just an example of an experiment we ran at Northam. So we've got um, sowing date on this axis here from the 12th of April right through the 5th of July. We've got the earliest um, spring that most people grow and the latest, we'll call it a spring, um, that we grow. And then we've got some winters um, from France and from the UK. So what you'll notice is that in the um, spring germplasm, we're, we're flowering um, in July, um, so in a very, very um, risky part of the um, environment to be flowering in. But we then the um, winters in that particular uh, thing are, are flowering after middle of September. And we know from yield trials is that they're not, they're not out yielding um, our best springs, even though they're flowering in the middle of Jul July in, in the absence of frost. So the difference in flowering, flowering time was around that um, 20, no, four weeks difference in our spring material um, and the difference in the, um, in the winter material about 10 days. However, there's you know, a 40 to 50 day yield gap a phenology gap between there. And so what we would like to see is have is if we had germplasm that was in that window, can we de-risk the system for barley and can we actually improve the productivity of barley going forward with early sowing? 
So we've obviously got wheat varieties coming out that are looking to uh, move into that space between the true winters and the true springs. Um, and obviously what we want to work with is through the proof of concept that if we've got barley material that we flower in here, we could actually um, re reduce some of our risk and increase our yield going forward. So, and this is what a seven tonne per hectare crop of Maximus looks like if things go well. So I'll take any questions on time of sowing whilst we're at it. So if there's anyone got um, any questions around that, we'll answer them um, right now on the floor, so. Ben's got one, Alice, I think. Oh. The chief scientist is not allowed to ask questions. You sit there and to watch and listen, okay? Didn't you get yes, that ruling in your brief? So. I'll put on my old frost hat, Blakely, thank you. Um, in terms of your yield loss off the front end of that curve with frost in your trial set, so for, bar for wheat, we would lose somewhere between 40 to 60 kilograms per hectare per day going off the back end of the time of sowing, so flowering after the optimum. Yep. Um, in frost prone environments, we lose somewhere between four to 600 kilograms per hectare per day by flowering too early um, with wheat. What's the similar rules of thumb you can give the guys in the audience for barley? Um, so the loss on the back end in that one was 33. Um, and I didn't actually um, do it, but it's um, probably going to be 60 kilos per hectare per day. Obviously, if it's obliterated, it's obliterated, right? So if it's if a bad enough frost, then everything's gone. So it's going to be a big number, but in general, in those in that one there, um, I'd have to go back and calculate it. Sorry. So. Yeah. So I did some rough calculations for there you. you so it's around 100 kilograms per hectare for, for the front end of the curve compared yep. to the back. So what? But what you see is that's much less for barley that front end of the curve than what it is for wheat. So if all our data sets are showing the wheat loss before the optimum is around you know four to six hundred kilograms per hectare today per day by flowering before the optimum, whereas for barley, it's much less going earlier. And th but the question is, is can we improve yield by, by having the right phenotype for planting early? And that's, that's the question that sits on the table right now. So barley is a better choice and oats is a better choice for those earlier planting windows in general, yes. Thanks, Blakely. I, that was really good to point out to the breeders in the room, that gap we've been screaming about for quite a few years. Um, Frost has come up a number of times today, and and I think as an industry, the elephant in the bedroom is this time of sowing stuff. Um, farmers farm a landscape, and most farmers in the southern half of the state know their frosty paddocks, and they've got to do something different on those areas, and that's where they may give up the perfect flowering window on their high frost risk. One, they could change their species. Two, give up the give up some yield and don't put your short season barley on your frost prone paddock early, delay it by a week. As Ben showed, if you're a bit late, you're losing kilos a day. If you're a bit early, you're losing hundreds of kilos a day. Um, but we just, yeah, we've just got to think in the landscape and um, across your farm, on the average to low risk areas, we've got to go hard and early. That's pretty obvious. But in those other parts of the landscape, you can make a massive difference to profitability of your clients' businesses by getting them to understand the risk profile of, you know, how often do you have clients have a breakdown during seeding and the last half their program's unfrosted in those bad years and those sort of things. So there's little things we growers can do to really change the, the whole business risk profile. Yeah, so I mean, the, the point is that obviously whilst barley is um, more resilient, I suppose, in those early windows, 80% of our production is still sown to varieties of, of, of what we consider to be quick or early maturing. So we don't have a lot of options that are in the longer season types. We've we got, you know, the Lockyer, the Banks, the Laparouse type material, but they're not popular varieties across the landscape. They don't necessarily give you more yield per se. They, it's a bit like a PGR. It's about protecting your yield rather than giving you more yield with that particular material. Yeah, okay. So. This is about that protein audit. So again, I put up a similar concept um, earlier in the year. So this is uh, about 80 trials worth of nitrogen response data um, collected over a number of, number of years. It's, um, and really what it looks at is, can you use your um, protein data from your farm to give you an idea of whether or not you're near maximum yield? Now the reason I, this, I put this up and why it's important to us is, 
In the main, most barley in Western Australia is delivered with about 10, 10.5% protein in order to get into the malt barley window. So if, we, if we're forgetting the fact that we're growing malt barley now and we're just about delivering grain to the bin, happens to be called feed, um, but we're trying to maximise yield, that what this graph or what this chart tells us is that essentially we're not maximising our yield at our current production systems. So it just means that if you, you need to rethink um, how you're growing barley if you want to get um, a bit more out of it. So what it says is that in the less than three ton environment, the probability of being within 90% of your maximum nitrogen yield is the highest if the proteins are between 11.5 to 13.5%. And in and above the three, and a half, the three ton uh, environment, essentially um, you've got a broader window, but your grain protein levels, uh, if they're above 11.5%, there's a higher probability that you'll be within 90% of your, ma of your um, maximum yield due to nitrogen. So when you sit down and do your audits with your clients, and obviously not a good time to be talking about nitrogen right now in terms of the price. However, if there's farming systems, paddocks and all the rest of it that you're consistently getting more than 11.5%, it's likely that that farming system is appropriate for maximum yield for barley. If, you, if your clients are delivering eight or 9% protein barley, they're, they're leaving yield in the paddock. Okay, so how big is the nitrogen response that you're likely to, um, to see? So what we've done is with, not, not me, but what Craig's done, unfortunately Craig's had to leave because he's actually broken an axle in his wheelchair, so he's gone off to get that um, welded up. So if there's any tough questions in this particular space, you're gonna have to hold them for, um, um, for Craig. But he did an analysis though, trials and looked at organic carbon, soil type, um, um, maximum yield, um, sowing date, et cetera. And bear in mind, most of these trials are sown in a non-legume rotation. And what we found is that the size of the, of the um, nitrogen response is determined by the maximum yield that you have, um, and it's determined by sowing date. So I'm gonna put up the decision tree um, that essentially what it says is that this is the maximum, the nitrogen response that we've seen in our trials. Okay, so it's 80 odd trials. So if you're in the less than four and a half ton environment and you, less, and, and you yield less than three tons per hectare, we're expecting about a half ton response to nitrogen as possible. If you're in the 3.1 to 4.5 ton per hectare environment and you sow before the middle of May, potentially you can have a 1.2 ton response to nitrogen. But if you sow after the middle of May, then you're likely to see about a half ton response to nitrogen. So again, this is important for next year when, you, when you're trying to work out how much nitrogen you should put on and where you should put your nitrogen on and what type of crops you should put your nitrogen on. If, you're, if your business is going more than four and a half tons per hectare, then again, if you're sowing before the middle of May, then you can see a nearly a two ton per hectare response. So again, a big return on investment for nitrogen in that particular scenario. But in those super high yielding environments, then if you're sowing after the middle of May, then you're likely to see around a 900 kilogram um, response in nitrogen. So again, the point about this one is, is for next year is I'm hoping this sort of information will help you with your clients work out what's, what sort of nitrogen strategies you put on your barley in order to maximize your yield. So do we have any questions on um, those particular um, comments around using protein as an audit factor? Bear in mind that you know um, seasonality comes at big time and some of the nitrogen um, expectations that you might have. Seems to be good on that one. Okay, so just the last one is just on plant density. Okay, so again, I just need to reiterate, everyone's so used to saying, oh, wheat doesn't respond to plant density, so therefore I don't need to do anything with my barley. Barley is so different, okay? It relies on those tillers and you cannot compensate for not putting enough plants in the ground. Barley doesn't compensate by putting more grains on the ear, okay? It's all about setting up that um, potential pre-anthesis. And so if you look at the low rainfall, the low to medium rainfall environments, this is at three different rates of nitrogen. Essentially, you've got parallel curves in this particular case. So the more nitrogen going on, you've still got the same response to plant density. Um, what we're suggesting in that environment is around 150 plants a square metre is where you're likely to get your optimum um, um, yield.
but if we move to the higher rainfall environment, we actually see a bit of an interaction where we're getting a slightly bit, we're getting more response with more nitrogen that we put on. So we're getting a higher response to plant density with higher nitrogen. And the curves are quite different, okay? So here, going from um, 100 to 150 plants per square metre is 3% yield. You probably change varieties for that. Um, in the high rainfall environment, from going from 100 to 150 plants per square metre is 6% yield. So still um, a significant value, but if we go from 150 to, to 200, we can add another 3% yield to, our, um, to what we're growing in the paddock. So again, if our primary dream is just about delivering as much grain as possible, then you want to be on this part of the curve, not on this part of the curve in both environments, okay? You want to be out here, because the only thing we're worried about delivering is test weight. And at these things, the test weight drops by a, ton, a kilo, kilogram per hectare or, or, or less. You're not going to influence your ability to deliver barley into the feed stack by increasing your plant density. So, um, just on the plant density one, so we'll take up some of the slider questions as we're going in this space. Have we got any um, questions around um, plant density and why you wouldn't? Obviously, there's some machinery things, there's paddock size, how much seed you've got on hand determines some of these things. Um, but do we have any questions on on plant density per se as being a driver, one of the key drivers you need to have for, um, for grain yield. No? Just get Slido up as we go. Yeah. yeah. So just in terms of the main messages again, um, if you're trying to get the, more, the most yield out of your barley, um, then obviously that mid-April to mid-May window is, is where you're likely to get your highest yield potential for. Obviously, you've got to choose the most appropriate variety for the planting situation. So as Garen said, planting Spartacus on the 15th of April comes with risk in those risky environments. But if you're not in a risky environment, then obviously it's not necessarily going to perform any less than putting another variety in um, in that particular part of the environment. Plant density is, 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 is an important tool for, um, for barley um, in getting yields up. We can use historical information to say, have I been doing the right thing in terms of my nitrogen strategies, my farming system? And that's where that protein audit comes in. If you're going in mid-May or before, then obviously you're probably going to spend a bit more money on your nitrogen budget for next year. Um, and that I would certainly, um, if you haven't got a copy of the sowing guide or haven't downloaded it, please um, go and have a look at the sowing guide because Deep Herd staff have put a lot of effort into um, writing the sowing guide and it is a valuable tool for getting as much information as we can out of the, um, what's available to us to help you with growing um, the best variety options for, um, for next year. So I think that basically covers um, uh, what I wanted to say until we get uh, quick, a Q&A from um, the floor. So Ben?